Would you bow your heads in a word of prayer? Lord, we thank you for all you have given us and the many blessings in our lives. Help us to be faithful in our service to you. Amen. Good morning. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Everybody's Irish today. You know that. I want to read some scripture from the book of John, the second chapter, verses 12 through 25. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove them from the temple area. Both sheep and cattle he scattered the coins of the money changers, and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demand of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this. And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he was, had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled that he had said, then they will believe the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, nor he knew, nor, for he knew what was in a man. And the Lord add blessing to the reading of those few verses of Scripture this morning. <clears throat> there was a guy who was telling about a, a revival in his hometown somewhere in Texas when he was a boy. It was a big time. The revivals came to town. They set up the tent and everything. It was a very spectacular extravaganza. The whole town turned out. This was big time for this little town. The tent was open, the flaps were up, and the floor was sawdust. And the buildup of the preacher's message came at a very slow pace, but his point was unmistakable and, and highly personal. He wanted them to worry about their status in the next life. The preacher questioned the strength of each person's faith. One night, during the revival, the preacher had worked himself up to a furious pitch about their shaky loyalty to the Lord. And at the height of emotion, the preacher reached behind him into a box and pulled out two snakes and threw them into the congregation. Apparently, the preacher thought the snakes would be a perfect object lesson. People couldn't tell whether the snakes that he threw into the congregation were poisonous or not. So they started to scramble. They jumped up and they're, they're running out of the place. They're, 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 they're running for their lives because they don't know whether the snakes are poisonous or not. And the preacher's up on the platform and he kept yelling, You see, your faith is fragile. Yeah. <laughs> now, whether we agree or not with this revival preacher's tactics, it certainly got people's attention, did it not? It would get your, you know, <laughs> I was going to bring a snake here, but Gene said no. We got one in the shed. <laughs> Anyhow, there are times in our lives when we need someone to get our attention. 
Sometimes we get stuck in our rut. And the only way out for this is someone to share, shake us up. Somebody to just shake us. Jesus certainly had that effect on the religious establishment of his time. He had been looking forward to going to Jerusalem, as all the Jews did, and the temple for Passover. People from all over the known world would be there for worship. And just being there uh, uh, with, with other pilgrims was exciting. It was like going to annual conference or something. You know, you, you're just excited to get there. When Jesus arrived at the temple, though, he was upset by what he saw. Didn't like what he saw. There in the temple courtyard were people buying and selling cattle and sheep and doves for sacrifices. The merchants who were selling this livestock thought that they were providing a, a, a service to the pilgrims that were coming in. At least they wouldn't have to bring their cattle or sheep with them as they made the trip. They were making it available for them to purchase when they got there. Sounds like a good idea. Temple workers were also exchanging foreign coins for temple currency. And again, they thought that they were doing the people a favor. People were required, you see, to use temple currency when they made their donations. Temple employees were providing a service exchanging foreign currency into temple coinage, which in itself is not a problem. But they also were taking advantage of people by charging a large fee to make this exchange. And that, of course, is a problem. Maybe they, uh, Jesus got angry the most, was when they were taking advantage of the people who would, could at least afford it, charging one day's wages to, to uh, exchange coins was outrageously high. The temple became wealthy from this questionable practice. They were gaining money. Uh, the temple uh, it was a, it's a place of worship and prayer and repentance for all the people was being maintained by swindling the people who could least afford it. It seemed the more money they made, the greedier they became, charging higher and higher rates of exchange. Jesus was upset by what he saw. And you know, we're not accustomed to Jesus being angry, are we? We're not. We like to think Jesus was always kind and loving to everyone he encountered. And at the very least, he was in control, right? We would like to think that Jesus never said a harsh word to anyone. But Jesus was so angry that he felt he had to do something to get the temple officials' attention. And there are times in our lives when it's all right to get angry. You can get angry. It's okay. Maybe that's the first thing we need to talk about this morning. It's okay to get angry. It's okay to get mad. Sometimes we get the idea that Followers of Jesus should be genteel people who, who never show their anger. But you know what? <laughs> you can reach a boiling point, can't you? Anybody reached a boiling point this past week? It's something? Yeah. Not me. But anyhow. There was a robber in California. A robber went into a bank. And he's wearing a motorcycle helmet with a full face mask. And he's carrying a gun. And he selected a teller who appeared to be in her 50s, kind of soft, kindly, and an easy mark. And he handed her a note demanding money or her life. The woman reached for the cash drawer, and then she looked at the note again. And her eyes flashed, and her lips pierced and clenched, and she pulled the entire cash drawer out, but instead of giving him the money, she started clobbering him over the head with the cash drawer, just beating the living stuff out of him with that cash drawer. And again and again, she came at him. She had had enough, you see, as if she was scolding him, 
money was flying everywhere, and she was beating him and yelling shame on him and bouncing that cash off of the, his helmet. And finally he ran out of, the, out of the bank trying to save his own life and got caught by the police in the shrubbery. And they came back in and they asked the woman, they said, what came over you? You were about to give him the money. And she said, she said I looked at the note, and there was a very, very naughty word in it. Different people get upset at different things. But there are times when all of us get angry. And sometimes the worst thing we can do is hold that anger in. There was a study done of 139 patients with chronic headaches. Researchers found that depression usually accompanied frequent headaches and suppressed. Anger amplifies the depression, and this in turn magnifies the pain, and this is a vicious cycle. It just goes on and on. Patients with chronic headaches get depressed because they're in pain, and the pain interrupts their lives. In turn, the depression makes the headache worse, and if the patient is one who tends to hold in anger, the more depressed he or she becomes. Anger in itself is not the problem. It's the tendency to avoid expressing it appropriately that seems to be associated with increased depression. Holding it in, not expressing yourself. Everyone gets mad from time to time. Are we in agreement? Sometimes the worst thing to do is to deny that anger and hold it in. We need to go to the person who is making us angry and get the matter resolved, if possible. And I'm saying if possible because sometimes it's not possible. It's not always a person, though, that is responsible for our anger. Sometimes it's a situation, like Jesus' anger with the money changers in the temple. It was a situation that he just could not tolerate. Sometimes anger can be creative, and it can be constructive. Some of the most repulsive social ills have been plagued, that have plagued humanity have been eliminated because somebody got mad. One person with a cause can make a, an enormous impact on the world. Being angered by what we see can lead to some very creative and constructive solutions. For instance, Mahatma Gandhi, Salt March, led to India's independence. Rosa Parks' refusal to move her seat in the bus created this uh, desegregation of the buses at the Supreme Court level. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. And who can forget the unknown rebel at Tiananmen Square? This one lonely guy standing in front of that tank. You can just visualize, you see it all the time. He's standing there defiantly in front of that tank. Jesus got angry. People had traveled great distances to go to the temple. The temple was one place where people could, could feel closer to God. The sanctuary was a holy place. It was a place they could feel God's presence in their lives. They could feel God. But in the middle of all the commotion of the cattle, the sheep, and the doves, and the money changers, people had a hard time praying. They had a hard time being quiet in their heart. There were so many distractions. Too much noise. Something had to be done. Jesus, you see, filled with the creative anger, made a whip out of cords and drove the merchants that were selling animals and overturned the tables. He threw them out. Those who were employees who were exchanging coins. It was chaotic. He flipped over their tables. Money was flying everywhere. Cattle were running through the temple courtyard. Coins spilling all over the place. It was just mass hysteria. And Jesus made it happen. 
He was mad. He was upset. Jesus shouted, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Jesus got their attention. Sometimes we need to get angry. Anger can lead to creative and constructive solutions. But Jesus' anger is not the focus of our story this morning. Knowing the rest of the story helps us to see Jesus very clearly. Upsetting the religious officials by overturning the their changing booths and letting the animals run through the courtyard didn't endear Jesus to the temple establishment. They didn't like it. What right did Jesus have to do what he did? They wanted to know who Jesus was. Was he the awaited Messiah? Was he? Only the Messiah could get away with such shenanigans as this. The religious officials asked Jesus a question, point blank. What sign can you show us for doing this? What gives you the authority to do what you did here? And Jesus answered, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And of course, <laughs> Jesus' reply is not understood. They didn't understand what he said. They think Jesus is speaking of the temple while he is actually speaking about himself. In shock and disbelief, they informed Jesus that it has taken 46 years to build this temple. It's not possible to rebuild this temple in just three days. You can't do it, buddy. Following Jesus' death and resurrection, though, the disciples remembered this incident. They remembered it. Afterward, they remembered his words and understood them in a new way. They were words of faith. Jesus was not talking about the physical temple. He was speaking of his own death and resurrection. Bury his body, this temple, he is saying. And within three days, it will be resurrected. You cannot keep his body down, particularly if you understand his body to be the church. The church. For Christians, this is the temple. It's not a building made of human hands, but a communion of kindred hearts. You are the church. You, you, you. We're the church. We're the temple. It's not this building. It's not this, this shell of a house here on Robinson Street or any other street in any other town. It's the people inside. It's the dedicated Christians that have given their life to Jesus Christ that is the church. You are the temple. Wherever people are worshiping Jesus and serving him, there is the temple of the living God. Right there, right here. Right here. Jesus wanted to get people's attention. He did it by a display of anger. Sometimes it's good to get angry. It's good to get mad. Anger can lead to a creative and very constructive solution. In Jesus' case, he wanted to make a point. And that point was that God is not found in a building. No matter how high it's structured, no matter how big a cross you got on the top, no matter what you got on the inside, no matter how much it cost, God is the inside the church. God is to be found in fellowship of Christian people. You are the church. You and I are the church. Amen? Pray with me. Lord God, we just thank you for this building that we can come and be the church. Be the Christians that you would have us to be. Lord, help us to be that Christian. 
Help us to unite with one another to be the church. Amen. Oh, happy ones and holy ones, give us grace that we, like them, the meek and lowly, on high may dwell with thee. We are the church. You and I, here in the red pews, we are the church. And we need to remember that as we leave this building, that we leave as the church of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that you would be with us through this coming week and on in through the Easter season. Guide and direct us in our thoughts and deeds. Be with us in every endeavor that we take on. And until we meet again, amen.